Welcome to the one within all to a very different and special episode of Interverse. Different in just the sense that we're really reserving this for our paid subscribers, people that support either me or Dylan. So if you're hearing this, it's either the the free little intro that we're going to throw out there to entice people to come beyond the paywall or you're already supporting on Patreon or Dylan's Substack, to which we give thanks and praise. We appreciate that. With the work we're going to be discussing, Dylan's brand new book, The Real Universal Empire, getting into the details and the deep research that this book contains, it's not something that <laughs> should just be given out to, you know, cast pearls before swine. No offense, barnacles that, you know, chug along for free, attached to the hulls of our respective ships. We, we appreciate that you like our content too, but there's a thing about reciprocity in this particular work. Uh, Dylan was quite adamant he wants to... Make sure it's just for supporters, for the serious researchers. And I get that. I get that. And I'm, I'm excited to do something like this myself. So we're talking about his brand new book, The Real Universal Empire. I read all of it. It's excellent. I think it might be the best book that he's written so far. It also stands alone. So if you haven't caught up on the Spirit World books, but you're curious about making sense of the Farrago of history and myth, this book is really going to put your perspective in order by eliminating a bunch of nonsense and just bringing common sense to the equation of where did this universal empire system of priestcraft system of society really originate? What are the oldest origins of written language and letters? How did it get spread around? What actual boots on the ground, physical evidence can we point to architectural or artifact that demonstrates this thread of the historical chain of events <laughs> and can help us uh, see through the, the, the fog and the haze of mosaic history that's been foisted upon Western culture for millennia at this point and is completely disproven by many authors before Dylan, but particularly well done in the <laughs> refutations in his Spirit World series. And on that note, we also just wrapped up and submitted the sixth Spirit World book to Audible. So, in a couple of weeks, probably, or less, you'll be able to get my silky, sultry audiobook narration voice <laughs> for Terminalia, which is an excellent read as well. So we're going to be discussing- So proud of, of what we've been able to do. Sorry to interrupt you, but yeah, I'm so oh, proud yeah. of that. That book yeah, is I'm, so good. I cannot wait. Man, I don't even have notes in front of me. You hear this? I'm, I'm reading, as, it's as if I'm reading an introduction. That's how stoked I am about this content. I'm feeling, you know, the- the, the wine of poetry coursing through my veins or, or whatever. <laughs> so we're going to be going through what I felt like were great points uh, to, to talk about from the book. Having just recently read it, we got a ni nice outline. We're well prepared. We're handsome. This is going to be fun. So <laughs> Dylan, yeah, welcome. Looking sharp. <laughs> welcome, man. And thanks for being here as usual. Really excited that we're doing this in a, a more prepared way. The, the, the information, the gravy is just golden and piping hot. Well, thanks for having me. And um, just to reiterate, you know, thank you to all of you out there who are going to see this. That means you support us through my uh, platform on Substack and Chance's platform on um, Patreon and also possibly Substack. And, uh, you know, you your contributions are what help facilitate this work. So as much as we're proud of ourselves, uh, you can be proud of us too, because we're able to do that through your contributions. And, uh, we very much appreciate that. And basically the reason this is more for, um, private is we want to just start catering to those who actually support us, right? Not, uh, all inclusive stuff. And one of the reasons behind this decision for me is when I go and do a podcast and I see thousands of views or whatever, but it doesn't translate to sales. It lets me know that, there's either not enough interest in my work or people are just, you know, happy to listen. And it's kind of like a casual thing that we're just kind of contributing to their uh, sedation, if you will. You know, it's kind of like when people listen to podcasts while they're doing house chores or whatever. And, and that's fun. And we'll do that. We'll still do that with live streams. But when it comes to stuff that is like, um, you know, it's a full time job to prepare this stuff. And so when when we make this information available, uh, at the high quality that I make it available and it doesn't come back to me, then it, it tells me there's no, there's no point to doing it. And um, also the danger is 
I don't want a lot of people knowing about this because right now I can't post anything without simultaneously someone else posting the exact opposite and contrary viewpoint. And it's very um, unprofessional the way they do it. But because these people have big platforms, that's what's going to win right now. So I don't want to make all this avail information available to see it then get per per uh, perverted and degenerated by these internet people who just need something to talk about so they can get views and whatever else and sell you their, you know, their, uh, what you, their Patriot supplies and all that shit. <laughs> <laughs> That's a real thing. You, you, when you're in the podcast world, you, you start to see it that the parallel looks like parallel thinking, but it's more like, I don't know, mining the <laughs> parallel <reason>. inversion. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I feel like, feel like there's a word for that, but it's something that the, I don't know, the, the culture vultures have been up to for a long time. They get their finger on the pulse of some real researchers, some real thinkers, and but they've got funding or they've got a platform so they can take those ideas and run with it and get ahead of what is actually the truth or the good stuff. And sometimes it feels like you're dealing with shills, but I don't think you are. I think you're just dealing with people who are parrots. And they're not really doing the work. And that becomes apparent when they start talking about stuff and they can't quite get specific. You can tell they're basically regurgitating other people rather than saying, okay, this researcher or person gave these ideas. Let me dig into that and see what I can actually confirm in the historical record. They're not doing that. And you can see it by the sloppy etymology and, you know, the sounds like, the words where they sound like each other and they just assume that everything's connected in certain ways that they're not. And uh, hopefully we'll set the record straight and dive into some of the gravy. And I'm excited to see what, I can't wait to see what you learned and more like what, what stuck out to you, you know, cause everyone's different. And the goal for this book is to make it accessible to as many people. Like, I think you could have given me this book when I was 10 years old. I was a voracious reader as a child. I stopped reading once I got into my teens because there wasn't really books that were like being given to me that were fun to read. And my goal is to at least contribute this to something that teachers and stuff could give to their children or homeschool people could give and say, Hey, you're going to learn a lot of things in uh, your history classes, but I want you to be prepared for this. So you can arm yourself when people say nonsense, you can contra, uh, not, I don't want to say contradict or like combat. It's not really something to be like uh, combative about or combative about. It's just something to say, hey, if that's what you're claiming that, for example, that this culture descended from Greece, why is their language nothing like Greek if they got their letters from Greeks? You know, like there's just a lot of things you can do. And one of the cool things that got me going with this is seeing um, years ago when I was going through Godfrey, Godfrey Higgins material, do you remember he published I'm still something? going through it. <laughs> oh yeah. It's a, it, For years. I mean, you're going to, you're going to be, yeah, that's a, that's, that's a big commitment. Uh, even if you read that every day, you'd probably, probably take you a couple of years to get through his work. Um, at least a year, but if uh, you're really comprehending it, processing it and taking notes on it. You might get through, yeah. you know, a, a page front and back in 30 or 40 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what I do. You know, like we do that. We don't, when we see something, we don't reckon, I know you're the same way. When we see something we've never heard before, we look it up and we see what, what we're able to follow. And if we can find something great, we've now just confirmed it. If we can't, it's like you said the other day, you looked up something and you're like, I don't know. I don't have any receipts on this. It's cause it's probably wrong. If we're being honest, it might not be, but generally speaking, when there's no receipts, it's because it was uh, an error. Um, but he, he posted one thing, something. One, one thing I learned from your book today that I looked up a word that I didn't know is a, th a thassalocracy or a thassalocracy. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Lords of the sea. A, right. Exactly. That's a, an empire that, or a nation who makes its way on the seas, a, a sea bound in, empire. So the thassalocratic states, they don't usually progress very far inland. They, populate and colonize along the coastal areas of all the places that they can get into range of. And that's what this real universal empire, that's what we're really looking at is a thassalocratic empire. And then so I had to look up that word today from reading your book. Uh, and also for people that really want to get their 
teeth into stuff and, or wrap their arms around stuff. What we were just mentioning is worth it to think about. And you never know. You might just consider yourself a, someone who's curious and wants to know stuff. Or, or, but you, you may someday realize that you have all this knowledge in your head, but you don't have the link, the linkages to access it unless just sort of the right conversation comes up and it pops into your mind and you're like, oh yeah, I did know that. So whenever you're going through material like Dylan's or sources that maybe he references or your own personal research, it could be on any topic. If you get into the habit of having a physical notebook or uh, a notepad open on your laptop, and whenever you learn something that you think is pertinent, to start just transcribing that down, uh, a quick note with the page number attached to it, the very least, just make highlights in the book, your physical book you're reading. But eventually doing that, you're going to realize better and better ways to systematize those notes that you're taking. And before you know it, you're going to have a bulk of information that is easily going to be shaped into some sort of publication or accessed later for whenever you want to reference it just to know something. And I recommend that, that you make your time spent reading and learning mean something by t keeping tabs on what it is you're learning. So it's not just passive consumption where maybe one to 5% of it uh, retains somewhere in your memory banks. You know what I mean? That's something I learned from you. And it's been incredibly helpful to take that approach, even though it, it takes discipline and it takes more time. There, there's nothing more valuable. Well, a lot of people in this space are already big picture thinkers anyway. And I wouldn't have been able to learn or come up, come to the conclusions that I came to if I didn't take meticulous notes and then have an overall picture to, to draw from. It's like each piece of information is a dot. And eventually that dot starts, those dots emerge into like a picture so that when you connect them, it's like, Oh, that's exactly what it is. And, um, it's, it's a great way to, uh, like you said, retain information, but it's just a great way to organize things. And if you put them in like a word document, whenever you need to revisit, even if you never publish the information, you can use the keyword searches and find stuff. And I do that all the time with my work that I've already done, because like we've talked about one man can't remember all this stuff. You're going to, you know, that's why uh, I make as much. Um, and I don't know if when's this going to get published, but right now there is a sale going on where I, because Amazon got rid of their matchbook program, I can't make the eBooks free for the people who bought the paperbacks anymore. But what I can do is I enroll them in these little sales that happens once every quarter for like a week, you can get everything for 75% off. And in this one, you can get the first two uh, books of the tale of Honora for free. So that's kind of exciting. Very cool. Yeah. I've been using a program called Scrivener. I don't know if you've heard of that, but it's a, it's a $60 program. And then you've got a license for it. You can put on any of your computers and it's just a, a nice, simple, almost kind of old school looking uh, format where you can easily create like branching note page trees. And it's got sort of an internal system that you could format a book with. And it has guidelines for that, whether ebook or, or a physical book. So that's been a really helpful place for me to store my notes because, again, it's I got a quick reference. But there's loads of things like that. There's Evernote. There's Microsoft OneNote. The, the, the point is that you're just keeping track of stuff somewhere. Nah, that's are, are, your notes, are your notes starting to look like Charlie from Always Sunny in Philadelphia? <laughs> <laughs> a little. That's Gabe. You're, you're mistaking me for Gabe. My stuff's pretty well organized. Like, I'm, I just opened my Scrivener, and right here I have a note page that lists all the Hebrew letters, their numerical value, a like a type uh, font of the Hebrew letter for quick reference, uh, the meanings of the letter, the tarot cards associated to the letter, the way the letter is spelled if you were saying the letter at name as a word, the numerical value of the word spelled out or alternate spellings. So I have like, you know, I have the master cheat sheet of, of Hebrew, mystic, Hebrew language mysticism that I just put together as I figure things out. And that came about from doing the Loki work. And what's great about that is you've now done that work. So if you wanted to publish that in a book and if you've double checked it and it's all legit for someone like me, that's a great resource, right? So it's like, I don't have to ever do that work because you've done it. And that's how this 
force, if you will, whatever's going on. I don't force is not the right word, but it's just a, a lingo thing that came to mind. It's a quickening, right? It's there's something that happens with um, knowledge and wisdom. And as you acquire it, and the more people that can contribute rock solid facts, the more people can see the big picture and, and then from their experience in life, contribute to stuff that you and I would never have the access to see. And um, as we've talked about, a lot of the information that we'll get into is not well published. And some of it's in private libraries, private collections, so it's not published at all. So the more people that are, some people are sitting on gold mines and they don't realize it because they just have to, they've never had the perspective that we're about to give them the content that we're talking about. Well, you know what? This seems like the perfect moment that from, from, uh, from this point, we're going to leave behind the, the free people that are getting the teaser that comes up to this moment and we're going to get into our outline. So Make sure you follow us over to Dylan's Substack or my Patreon. We don't care which one of you, which one of us you support. We just want reciprocity for the great information. I just got a, min, uh, a message a half, like not even a half an hour ago from someone who just subscribed and they want to support you as well. So, it, you know, it, it, people want to support you. You just got to give them an opportunity to. And if you're putting out good work, they're not actually supporting you. They're getting something in return. So it's not like a charitable event, right?